Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Well, when you think of a monument, you probably think of a statue or something like that, but it's also really important to think about the fact that a monument is something that serves as a good reminder, which is why I am so thrilled today to be joined by Barry Malofsky, who is the president, and Gail Kennard, who is the vice president of the LA Cultural Heritage Commission. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be talking to you about this remarkable collection of wonderful places in Los Angeles that I'd be willing to bet that a lot of people don't know and are going to be so thrilled to hear about. So let's get started. Okay. Great. So we're kind of in the 60 year point right now, but what qualifies a property to be culturally significant, especially in an area like Los Angeles? Well, I, I think the primary qualification is it tells the story. Mm -hmm. you know, the, there are three primary categories that, that we look at, one of which is, is it a site which is important in city, national, or, or state history? Did something important happen there? Second criteria we look at is whether someone important, someone of note, lived there. And the third category, which is the one that most people assume is what we look at, but really it's, it's just one of the three categories, mm -hmm. is, is it architecturally significant or is it the work of a, of a master architect? So the architectural, is it pretty, which is what most people assume is what we're looking at, really is just the third of the equation. And quite often, there's an overlap between, between categories, between criteria. Um, but it really is the combination of all three that we're, we're considering. Okay, well, it started with an effort, and literally was 60 years ago, correct? Correct. Uh, to save uh, the Leonis Adobe. Okay, so A... What is that? B, where is it? And, and how did the whole effort to actually save it and make it a cultural landmark start? Leonis Adobe is at the westernmost border of the city of Los Angeles. Um, it was, it's significant both because of its location, because it's an adobe from the early settlement of, of the city. Um, and also, also significant, one of the things I think we'll touch on later in, in our conversation, is the diversity it represents because Leonis, in fact, married a Chumash Indian woman. So there's some, some level of diversity introduced into the process mm -hmm. at the very beginning of, of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, the adobe was originally threatened for demolition for a parking lot, mm -hmm. which happens mm -hmm. quite often in, in city monuments of someone makes a threat. <laughs> You know, someone wants to tear something down. Or and, has an idea. Has I don't know idea. if everybody is that malicious <laughs> right, in their well, thought process, but yes. Uh, and that they, they sort of... That starts a process, and that process of the, the dem threatened demolition organized the community around around trying to save it. And then at the first meeting of the commission, I think it was mm -hmm. August 6, yeah, 60 yes. years ago, yeah. yes. uh, it was the first monument designated by the city. It's also a really great story about people saving something that they love, and that's really cool. Um, you know, and then there are the other properties you were telling me about the different parameters. Um, there is the Morgan House, which, as we now know, is the Harbor Area YWCA. Now, I'm going to ask a question that I already know the answer to, but you were mentioning architects and right. prestigious architects. So the architect of this particular building yes. was... Julia Morgan. Julia Morgan, yeah, who's an amazingly interesting woman architect. She was born in San Francisco, 1872, early, early on, born in San Francisco, became the first woman to be licensed as an architect in the state of California. Most people would know her because she was the architect for Hearst, Hearst Castle. Castle. Right. So she had a long-term relationship with William Randolph Hearst, of course, built Hearst Castle, and he was also the owner of the Herald Examiner newspaper here in Los Angeles. So she also designed that building. She also was associated with women's issues, so she worked a lot on buildings for the YWCA. And in fact, we have three or four cultural heritage uh, monuments, HCMs, that are designed in the city of Los Angeles by Julia Morgan including the Morgan House that you mentioned, which is in San Pedro, which is also showing the geographic diversity of, of our monuments. So uh, she designed another one for the YWCA, the YWCA in Hollywood, Hollywood Studio Club. And these were buildings that were designed for single women, for housing, for services, 
Really interesting story with Julia Morgan. So I'm going to add a, a, an additional question onto that. So the one at the Harbor Area YWCA has been given this designation. What about these other ones that she worked for, or is this the one that sort of represents her work? No, here the in one LA? in Hollywood, the Hollywood Studio That's Club, has also been designated. Um, there are other buildings that she designed that are outside the city of Los Angeles. There's one in Pasadena and other areas that are not under the city of Los Angeles, so we don't have jurisdiction of, over those. But she did do amazing amount of work, not only in Southern California, but also in, in her native Northern California. You know, you hear these, you know, these places that mark something um, for whatever reason they mark, and they, yeah. they spur these stories. I mean, you mentioned, you know, that they all have stories, but they right. spur more and more stories. And the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company building has so many stories within it that it could probably fill its own library. Um, and it also represented really important shifts in Los Angeles. So name, what are some of the players in this one? Because it's not just the architect, it's the artists and all the things inside. Right, right. I'm going to defer to you on that since yes, you did the tour of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I may add something on the end. but <laughs> Yeah, the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company was a, a, a response to the lack of ability for African Americans, not only in Los Angeles, but all over, to buy life insurance. So some very industrious business people, including a woman, a man named William Nickerson, started this company to sell life insurance policies to prim primarily African Americans in, in Los Angeles and other places. And the company did very well. Uh, they, they built a building that was designed by another African American architect in 1928 on Central Avenue. That architect's name was James Garrett. And then, after the war in 1949, they were doing really, really well. They were the largest African-American-owned business west of the Mississippi. So they commissioned the preeminent African-American architect, Paul R. Williams, to design an office building. And it's on the corner of Western and Adams. And it has become a, a monument to the ability of African-American business businessmen to, to create something. Not only did they create this building, and they had an amazingly prominent architect do it for them, but they also decided that they want to incorporate art into the building. So they hired a very prominent art, um, artist then, Hale Woodruff, Charles Alston, and they incorporated murals inside of the history of what they call Negro, the Negro history in California. And it talked about the accomplishments uh, of, of, of through, all throughout from the early beginnings of the city up until the, the current time. And then they continued that theme and they collected artwork from other prominent African American art, artists, including Betty Saar and others that people might know about. So it's a really a marvelous story of an intersection between the architecture, which is significant, as Barely was talking about, the cultural history. Uh, the economic and social history, it, it touches all of those. And we were very fortunate to designate that. It was the 1,000th um, HCM, Historic wow. Cultural Monument in the city of Los Angeles. And like you said, one thing begets another. Because I know a lot about Paul Revere Williams because um, I just think he's a remarkable uh, in many, many ways here mm -hmm. culturally and, you know, very significant in Los Angeles and just his story of having to have his clients in front of him because he was an African, American you know, he learned to write backwards in order to, you know, make his clients feel comfortable. All the lost properties in Los Angeles that we may have not realized were his, but now I'm fascinated by these artists that are inside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, the, the strings that unravel when you start seeing now. Now, is that building exactly, exactly as is? Unfortunately, the, the company no longer exists. Right. Um, and the building was in very bad condition. Uh, but about seven or eight years ago, a nonprofit called the South, South Central Los Angeles Regional Center, which is a nonprofit that serves people with developmental disabilities, acquired the property and did a wonderful renovation of the building, and they're using it for their own, for their own services now. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Well, so it got repurposed. And I think that's an important thing to talk yeah, about is that a lot of these that. historic buildings may not serve the original purpose. I mean, the whole 
revitalization of downtown Los Angeles, right. the, the Broadway Historic District, is through an adaptive reuse ordinance, which sort of is a tag on or add along to the cultural heritage ordinance mm. that allows what once were office buildings to be reused as residential. Oh, okay. Which therefore was was the primary movement that sort of brought downtown Los Angeles, you know, that whole historic district back. And it's now populated by how many thousands of people? Mm -hmm. uh, people who work in City Hall, people who work in legal offices, people who just want to be living in an urban environment with some some history to it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's let me understand the parameters of that because, as we said, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, these places become potential, you know, heritage monuments for very specific reasons. But there are limitations as to what this designation can, you know, save or protect, or you know. So, what are the rules and regs, or does it vary with each property? Because I know that certain properties have been. Um, almost in its, their entirety saved. Some mm -hmm. properties have just been designated and repurposed. Other properties mm -hmm. are probably unrecognizable as what they originally mm -hmm. were. So what are the rules and regs here? What does having this designation do to protect and or hold on to whatever they are? Well, I think that really varies by, by the property. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, depending on whether it was designated for its architectural significance, in which case features and the architectural elements become much more important, okay. or whether it was designated for historic event that may have happened there or association with a historic person. Okay. But basically what we look at without getting into a lecture on historic preservation. <laughs> I don't mind. No, uh, I don't think you have time for it. Oh, that's the problem. Let's come back. <laughs> uh, are what we call character defining features. Like what are, what are the elements that sort of tell the story the best way? So quite often, if you make the transition from an office building to residential. Character defining features in that case would be something like the lobby, the corridors, the doors, oh, the okay. exterior features, the windows, mm -hmm. you know, the, the brick material or the materiality of, of the building. Whereas you know, the, the walls between the offices are sacrificial because they no longer serve that purpose. Right. Okay. If, you're, if you're dealing with a single family residence, again, it's the primary reason that it was designated would, would be the controlling factor, but quite often, you know, bathrooms are remodeled because a 1932 bathroom mm -hmm. may not work for a family in, in 2022. Mm -hmm. Kitchens are quite often remodeled. Um, we, we do have a problem when original windows are taken out and replaced with aluminum windows, oh. when wood siding is covered over with stucco. Oh. But again, quite often the windows can be replaced and the stucco can be removed. So it really, it's, it's a broad range, but mm -hmm. it's, it goes through the process of the Office of Historic Resources sort of works with the owners to see what, what the elements are that are important, what can be done to sort of incorporate those and maintain the historic mm -hmm. character and the historic nature of the property. So you bring up a good point. A lot of these are, are public, you know, facing facilities of the YWCA, you know, mm -hmm. the, the um, Golden State Mutual Life and building, et cetera. But a lot of these are private properties. Mm -hmm. And a yeah. lot of these, um, you know, as you said, may or may not be moved, but there are private properties. And there's one in particular, which I was surprised was a private cemetery. Mm. So how does that end up being a cultural monument? There is a very interesting story about the Marquez Cemetery, right. which is in the Brentwood Pacific Palisades area. Okay, And historically, this property was part of a Spanish land grant. So it goes back several centuries. And fortunately, members of that family, although they, know, they don't have control of all the land that they used to when it was originally under a Spanish land grant, they knew about the cemetery and they frequented that cemetery. So in about 2000, uh, there was a move to designate that cemetery as a historic cultural monument, and it was successful. But it's in a quiet residential neighborhood. It's not on a public area. In fact, it's set back from houses on the street. So there had to be um, an easement so that family members could actually get to between these other parcels to the cemetery. And then um, development happened over the years, and we had designated a monument, but. Um, one of the adjacent, adjacent property owners wanted to build a new single-family home there. Oh. The family was very upset. 
because they felt that there were also remains of their family members under in, the new under, house. Under the new house. So um, it was a difficult situation. We had a very emotional commission meeting about it. There were tears. There was anger. It was very, very emotional. But we were able to broker a deal so that the new property owner could continue with the, 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 uh, the single-family home, but there would be an expansion of the easement so that possible remains could be, re could be protected. So that's an example of a historic cultural monument that's not a building. That's you know, it's a, it's a cemetery, and it's, a, and it's part of the story of our area. I mean, we've had multiple, multiple layers of people who have settled here from the indigenous up to the current time. So inevitably, there are other places like this that we might not even know about. Well, you mentioned that because, you know, as you said, there are actual, there are many culturally significant um, mm -hmm. areas that have been designated. So, you mm -hmm. know, there's the, there's Korean and Japanese and things. So how did those play into it? How and where are they? And, you know, things have shifted, so they may not be in an area in which we would necessarily expect them to be. Well, I think there's a real mix, especially with the divergent background of, of the residents of Los Angeles and, and the history of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so tying back to the Marquez Cemetery, um, in fact, there are a lot of monuments which people go by on their daily lives and mm -hmm. don't re recognize that they're there, mm -hmm. but they're designated because they're telling the story of you know, that ethnic group, that, that group as they came to the city. There's, mm -hmm. We recently designated city council just approved rooming houses in which Japanese gardeners lived on, uh, mm -hmm. on Virgil Avenue. In Hollywood, <gasps> yes. Which are, which are still intact and are being used by, in fact, Japanese gardeners. What? Mm -hmm. uh, there is, you know, a house, and I always get this name wrong, so I won't even try and pronounce <laughs> it, um, where during the Japanese occupation of, of Korea from 1937 to 1945, mm -hmm. where, where the sort of national, national movement of, to liberate Korea was, was headquartered, was based in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it's a nondescript house on a side street near USC. Mm -hmm. another, another example is um, Sister Corita Kent. Yes, the pop art nun. The pop, the pop art nun. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the biggest responses we've had from community in terms of trying to save, save a building mm -hmm. um, what was her studio on uh, Western Avenue was converted, was now a, a dry cleaner's. And the owner of the property wanted to demolish it to make more parking for their new supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, but it is so important in the art history of Los Angeles, also in, in the fact that it was, a, it was a building that sort of tells the history of women and women in art in the city. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think one of the things that we need to work on as a commission mm -hmm. is of all the 1,200 commissions, uh, all the designations, only 3% are related to women, women's history. Oh. So it's really important that the Corita Studio was, was recognized, uh, the women's building down by, mm -hmm. by the uh, park in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other buildings like that really need to be, you know, Julia Morgan is another example, but 3%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think we're trying to do as a commission as we move forward is really recognize that the divergent forces that formed L.A., mm -hmm. that it really isn't about pretty buildings. Mm -hmm. It's about telling the story of the city. And the remarkable people that have come here and built Los Angeles right. because there's no place like it on the planet right. and it really attracts some remarkable. But I, this is a silly question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Did the dry cleaner owner, did the owner of the dry cleaner know that he was actually. Uh, the dry cleaner was a tenant. So he had no idea he, he that had, it was he had no idea. Workshop. He had no idea. See, I would think that that might be some of your you know, challenges in mm -hmm. designating these properties is that you know, who knows who's in them right now and who knows. Mm -hmm. Um, what their cultural significance was, unless you go tell them. Right. Well, one of the things which is really important, and it's something I've been advocating on a regular basis in, in commission meetings, is we don't necessarily know, but the Immaculate Heart community knew, and they could have brought that to our attention. In fact, they did bring it to our attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if there's a historic building or building you think is important on, on your street, in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. that's important to you, it's part of the history that you think is important to the city, bring it to the commission go through the nominating process, mm -hmm. or bring it to your city councilman and have them make the nomination. Because there are 800,000 properties in the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. you know, we can't identify all of them. So we rely on the public, mm -hmm. historic, historic, 
historians, preservationists, mm -hmm. but a lot of community members to sort of bring to our attention what they think might be important. In some cases they are, in some cases they aren't. But we don't know until someone brings it to us. We don't, we don't initiate, mm -hmm. except with one exception. Yeah. Few. Which few was? Said. I, 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 I initiated the Frank Gehry uh, Danziger Studio on Melrose Avenue, which is the only Frank Gehry building Good for you. designated in Los Angeles right now. Good for you. And, I mean, you think of all the things that he's contributed to this right. city and others. I mean, he actually, did you know that yeah. he had a play in the Neiman Marcus at South Coast Plaza? No. He actually designed things inside there as his first award. Okay. See? See? Look, I knew some things. <laughs> Not a lot, but I know a few. Um, I mean, we can all have these meetings, however, at a Starbucks. Oh. We could. <laughs> and, we could, and we could drive through, couldn't we? <laughs> yes, which was, in fact, uh, culturally fascinating. This was a fascinating story. Right. The Gilmore Gas Station. It's kind of right. a story of reinvention if you consider you know, what it was and what it means and now um, how well, we the, can the, enjoy it. The Gilmore Gas Station is a really good example of adaptive reuse of, of a building. It sat vacant for years, a big empty lot with a chain link fence around it, weeds growing around it. And Starbucks sort of saw it as an opportunity to, to use as a, a good location for their for their business mm -hmm. and a good opportunity to sort of take a, an existing building, see how they reprogram it, keeping the, the primary character defining features. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they sort of, you can drive through to get your, your coffee. Mm -hmm. You drive under under the, the, the canopy, mm -hmm. you place your order, you drive around, you get your coffee, there's a place to park on site. And the other thing which they did, which made it work, was a lot of the back of house storage and support functions that usually sits in the back of a Starbucks, they put off in a building on the side, which used to be the car wash. Oh. So it had no direct impact on, on the historic character of the building. It had no impact on, on the use of the site, because there was a car wash in that corner, but it allowed what was a gas station to be turned into a drive through Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And there's now a line down. Highland or Willoughby or mm -hmm. La Brea, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get your coffee on your way to work. Mm -hmm. And actually we have seen that because that particular location was used a lot by um, film studios and right. things because mm -hmm. of its interesting. You know, which, which also raises an interesting point because one of the things which is also important about preservation in Los Angeles mm -hmm. is it keeps it as a viable film location. Oh. Mm -hmm. If you think of, you, you don't need, necessarily need to go to New England to get a New England streetscape because there are historic preservation overlay zones. Right which look just like New England. Mm -hmm. You know, there you want, you want uh, Mediterranean style, you go to a different neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You want an industrial building of, of some period. You know, it's in LA, it's been preserved, and allows a lot more business to sort of stay in Los Angeles without having to go to remote locations around the country. Mm -hmm. So you bring up a question, because obviously those that care about history and those that care about cultural diversity and those that care about, you know, you know honoring contributors to our society would completely support anything that, you know, the Cultural Commission is doing. But what are some of the reasons for existence? Um, what are some of the, why is this important? Why is it necessary to maintain, you know, the forward momentum and make sure that these places are acknowledged and recognized? We have over 1,200 historic cultural monuments in the city. But that's just a small fraction. It's like one thousandth of percent of the actual number of structures in the city of Los Angeles. So people shouldn't get the idea that we're designating, you know, all these buildings and nothing else can happen with them if we designate them. If we designate a property, we don't preserve, we can't preserve the use. And many applicants, this comes, this comes to us often. There might be a really famous restaurant and people have been going there for decades, and they really want to preserve that restaurant. Mm -hmm. The building is kind of secondary. They mm -hmm. want to preserve the restaurant. We can't do that. Right. We can't preserve the use. So a new owner could come in and repurpose a gas station to a Starbucks, mm -hmm. for example. What's important about, to your question about saving the history, is that these monuments tell us about our past, the good of our past and sometimes the not so good of our past so that we have institutional memory so that we can remember that oh we used to drive through we used to have drive through restaurants we used to have you know soda fountains we used to have all these things that we don't have as much anymore and maybe they'll come back again you never know 
So the memory is really important. And in recent years, as Barry has mentioned, we're trying to tell a fuller story of the history of Los Angeles. He mentioned that only 3% of monuments have to do with women, the history of women. There's amazing women architects, in addition to Julia Morgan, who designed in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. People like Edith Mortensen Northman, who was designing back in the 1930s. Helen Huang, who was doing googie coffee shops. And other, other women architects, so only 3%. Totally, out of all the monuments that we have, the statistic is only about 11%, 11% have to do with women, people of color, indigenous, or LGBTQ history. Oh my. So that means we've got a big gap here. And the commission has taken on the challenge of trying to identify these places. And as Barry said, we don't always know the stories. So we need the public if you're in a neighborhood and you know a particular place, maybe it's in a dilapidated condition, maybe it's run down, it could, it could be worthy of designation because it tells an important story about your community. So definitely a challenge, but it also must be pretty exciting for you at this moment in time that there is this you know, realization and energy to move forward to find more and more treasures that might be buried in Los Angeles that you know can be revealed. Is there a lot happening in the commission to get this going? Um, obviously, the public is an integral part of this. Mm -hmm. So everybody make sure that you participate <laughs> and you know start looking around the neighborhood, which we'll find out how to do that soon. But how about you as architects? How does this feel for you personally? Because I know that you both you know, you know make your living as architects. Well, as an architect, the same way that the city learns from its, its past, its history, you know, I learn a lot by looking at how architects put buildings together 100 years ago, 200 years ago. I look a lot at the level of detail and attention they paid to how things come together and how do I bring that forward into, into, into my, my work. I, th I think it's important to, yeah, I also look at it in terms of how does that historic building within any neighborhood where I'm working give me a context, mm -hmm. give me some, some basis for, for my design as opposed to look what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that, that's, that's part of the story. But I, I think in, in terms of the commission, um, you know, the recognition that, w that we now have of the need to recognize the divergent communities of, of Los Angeles and the fact that city council members are now bringing to the commission you know, buildings aspects which they think are important with, within their community. Mm -hmm. It also helps that that makes the Planning and Land Use Management Committee of the subcommittee of, of city council more aware of, of those issues mm -hmm. and eventually when it goes on to city council. So I think it goes through the entire city process because, in, in fact, we're just an advisory committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if we make a designation, we haven't really made a designation, we've made a recommendation to council. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm seriously doubting that anybody necessarily says, no, we don't believe you. Yes, they do. Periodically. Do they really? Yeah, they really do. For, okay. for a range of reasons. I mean, or some, mm -hmm. some projects, some, some recommendations we make mm -hmm. will get held up for two years while they negotiate with the owner. Is there a way okay. to save it? And mm -hmm. But in some cases, it's like, yeah, you know, Tex Restaurant. I'll walk into mm -hmm. this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Tex Restaurant, which was incredibly important in the neighborhood of Echo Park to those mm -hmm. residents, the people driving down Sunset Boulevard. You know, the, the final designation on that consisted of no designation, but we'll save the sign and the bar top. And in some cases, they're just gone. So the most important part of all of this is obviously awareness and participation. So if people want to become more aware and people want to participate, what's the best way? The best way is to log on to the internet, of course. Uh, website is planningforla.org, and that's the number four. And there are several tabs below that. They can sort of check into existing monuments, what the process is, mm -hmm. and become informed in, in the process. Very exciting. Well, thank you both. This has been fascinating, and I wish we had six times as much time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Maria. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.